I want to assure you that I remain committed to providing the necessary leadership in liaison with partners towards finding sustainable solution to the challenges in Chad, in the Lake Chad region. President Buhari rallies global support in transfer of power in to civilian rule in Chad. With the training that has been going on, I think our men are better positioned. They have the response capability to carry out their job very, very well. Abuja Airport set for another round of recertification. Plus, new plates and spoons in the classroom. Federal government makes primary school pupils smile more. Good evening and welcome to NTN Network News. I am Joseph Johnson. Hingunu John Adams joins me from Lagos. Let's begin by telling you that Africa and the international community have critically an urgent uh, role to play in fostering a peaceful transition from military to civilian rule in the Democratic Republic of Chad within a set time of 18 months. President Mohamed Buhari stated this on Tuesday at the opening of the extraordinary summit of heads of state and government of the Lake Chad Basin Commission, convened to discuss the recent developments in Chad after President Idris Derby died on the front line while defending the territorial integrity of his country. State House correspondent Jidoni Fadi reports. At the head of the Oval Table sits President Muhammad Buhari as chair of leaders of the Lake Chad Basin Commission member countries and convener of the extraordinary summit. Prominently on the table is the development arising in the Republic of Chad occasioned by the death of former leader Idris Dabi. There's the threat of further conflict. President Muhammad Buhari says the need to support the Chadian government by all to effectively carry out its planned 18-month transition is sacrosanct. We have collectively shown that with commitment and with the desired support from the international community and our, our development partners, we can achieve success. President Bwari says the death of President Abiy had direct implications for the continued peace and stability of Chad as a nation, the Lake Chad region, and the wider Sahel region. As chairman of the summit of heads of state and government of the Lake Chad Basin Commission member countries, I want to assure you that I remain committed to providing the necessary leadership in liaison with partners towards finding sustainable solution to the challenges in Chad, in the Lake Chad region. The president observes that the region is faced with several challenges that need the support and engagement of all to overcome, saying it is a collective duty and in honor of the memory of the men and women that have died in search of peace in the region. And at the request of President Muhammad Ubari and in recognition of the immense and sterling contributions of the late President of Chad to peace and stability in the region, the summit observed a minute silence for the departed leader. A purposeful, positive and enthusiastic commitment of leaders can bring about change. And that's exactly what President Muhammad Ubari is requiring from leaders of the region and the international community in support of the people of Chad. In Abuja, Jide Onifadi, NT News. And the Lake Chad Basin Commission member countries have commended efforts of the multinational joint task force in the fight against terrorism, insurgency and other multinational crimes in the region and called for more collaboration towards maximizing the potential of the force. This was contained in the communique issued after a closed-door session of the one-day summit in Abuja. State House correspondent Jido Onyofade again reports. The session reviews the situation in Chad following the attacks by machinery group leading to the demise of Field Masha Idris Debis Itno, late president of the Republic of Chad, and their implications to the peace, security, and development in Chad in particular, and the Lake Chad and the Sahel regions in general. All Chadians 
to avail themselves of the service. The heads of state and government noted the seriousness of such attacks to the stability of Chad and to regional peace, security, and stability as enumerated by the executive secretary of the commission and further elaborated by General Muhammad Idris Dabi, president of the Transitional Military Council of Chad. The heads of state and government commended the efforts of member countries to address the security challenges in the Lake Chad Basin and reaffirmed their commitment to the promotion of peace, security, stability, and development in the region. It further noted that the appointment by the Transitional Military Council of an inclusive 40-person civilian cabinet headed by a prime minister from the opposition party. It's noted the 18-month duration of the transition program and urged the Transitional Military Council to embark on the process of national reconciliation and dialogue involving all Chadian stakeholders that will lead to free and fair elections. They reaffirmed their commitment to strengthening regional cooperation in the fight against terrorism, towards which end they resolved to increase their support to the Lake Chad Basin Commission and the multinational joint task force to enable them achieve their mandates. The Members note that the situation in Libya is intrinsically linked to the deteriorating security situation, not only in Chad, but also in the Lake Chad Basin and the Sahel regions. Urge the international community to provide for a comprehensive disarmament, demobilization, reintegration and reinsertion program for the foreign fighters expelled from Libya. Commended the efforts of the multinational joint task force in the fight against terrorism and other transnational crimes in the region and called for more collaboration among troops contributing countries towards maximizing the potentials of the force. Members commended President Muhammad Ubari for providing good leadership in the region. In Abuja, Jide Onifade, and your news. In the meantime, the federal government has condemned in strong terms the detention of the duo of interim president of Mali, Banda and Prime Minister Mokhtar Owen. The two key officials in the transitional government of Mali were reportedly taken by soldiers to the Kati military camp near the capital Bamako on Monday, 24 May. The federal government joined the African Union and other international bodies in calling for immediate and unconditional release of Mali's transition leaders in Mali. Uche Ugochuku reports on the situation in Mali. Mali's transition leaders, President Bada and his Prime Minister Mukhtar One, have been leading an interim government which took power after a military coup in August 2020. They were arrested and detained by soldiers who were unhappy with the new government announced by the transitional authorities. And taken to the same place, President-elect Ibrahim Keita was forcefully taken by coup colonels to announce his resignation nine months ago. As tension rise in the country, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, ECOWAS, the U and the U.S. have condemned the arrest, saying Mali's top politicians must be released without any preconditions. And we uh, endorse the uh, communication uh, of uh, ECOWAS, uh, ECOWAS and uh, the African Union, and we uh, urge a return to uh, uh, democracy and we hope that the necessary measures will be taken to do this. The Congolese president and the current chairman of the African Union, Felix Shisekedi, also condemned the action of the military aimed at destabilizing Mali. Meanwhile, investigations show that discussions are ongoing at the Kerti military camp, where the president and prime minister are being held. A delegation from ECOWAS, which played a key role in setting up the transitional government, is also due to visit Bamako. Uche Ugochukwu, NTA News. To other matters now, Chief Tain of the Ul Progressives Congress, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, has formally reacted to calls for self-determination in parts of the country, saying Nigeria is a nation that must be kept as one. Chief Tinubu made his views known while speaking to NTN News after an audience with President Muhammad Buhari Monday evening. 
we have already made our position clear that we want a one united, peaceful, stable country, productive and promising. Nigeria is not just a, 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 a rat village, it's a nation. I want to keep it as one. The APC leader, accompanied by the pioneer chairman of the governing APC, Chief B.C. Akonde, and other associates, were in the State House to commiserate with the president over the death of the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Ibrahim Atahiru, and 10 other officers. He prayed the Almighty Allah to grant the president and the bereaved families the fortitude to bear the irreparable loss. It's demoralizing. We want peace in Nigeria. It's disheartening. It's sad. And uh, to rub my mind with him too, to see uh, commitment to humanity. Northwest Geopolitical Zone Senator's Committee on Constitution Review is appealing to stakeholders to actively participate in the public hearing while sustaining quality contribution for the peace and development of the nation. Haruna Mohammed reports that the committee chairman, Senator Kabiru Gaya, was speaking to the media in Kaduna ahead of Wednesday's public hearing. In response to the calls for amendment of sections of the Nigerian Constitution, 9th Senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria mandated Committee on Constitutional Amendment to conduct public hearing in each zone of the Federation. The two-day public hearing will receive contributions on federal structure, gender mainstreaming, local government autonomy, fiscal policies, among other issues germane to national unity and progress from the stakeholders. Two centers have been assigned the tax in six geopolitical zones. Senator Kabir Gaya heads the Northwest Committee Kaduna Center comprising Kaduna, Kano, Jigawa, and Katana State. Constitution is the, the, the act for the governance of the country which affects every Nigerian and therefore we need every Nigerian to contribute uh, to the making of the law that will govern him and uh, I believe it is a way that uh, the Nigerians can feel that they are persuaded in this constitutional review. He says critical stakeholders consisting the civil society groups Youths Association, Trade Union, among others, will be allowed to freely participate in the public hearing. Haruna Mohammed, NTA News. Now, ahead of the next phase for recertification of the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, one of the major requirements is the airport's emergency plan, which helps to minimize the impact of an emergency, particularly in respect of saving lives. The exercise is expected to prove a model that conforms to contingency involving stakeholders. Aviation correspondent Emmanuel Ayimaro reports. An emergency starts with the pilot communicating with the air traffic controller about a distress. When it happens, different steps are taken to provide safety for lives and community involved. The simulation is to reactivate the roles of different stakeholders for proper coordination to avoid conflicting roles and poor service delivery during an emergency. We go into MOUs with uh, sister organizations like Federal Fire Service, hospitals, you know, construction companies, so that in such in such case of uh, accident or incident in the airport, we can call the NEMA so that they come to our rescue. So with this aside, we'll be able to see the, our response by our stakeholders. With the training that has been going on, I think our men are better positioned. They have the response capability to carry out their job very, very well. Other areas of concern include how to communicate to the general public, particularly those who lost their loved ones, provision of security, effective command and communication among stakeholders, and managing residents around the crash site. We have some observers that cover the exercise that to tell us what they think are the shortcomings and then we we'll work on them. Abuja Airport recertification is expected to be carried out by the Civil Aviation Authority, Emmanuel Ayemiro, 
NTA News. Let's take a break. We're back shortly. You're watching NTA Network News with me, Joseph Johnson. Media practitioners in the country have been enjoined to ensure that charlatans, hack writers, do not dominate the media space. Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed gave the advice when he granted audience to the management of Guardian newspapers in Abuja. Anthony Fawson reports. Describing the media as indispensable to the sustenance of a virile democracy because no true democracy survives without a professional, responsible and independent media, the Information and Culture Minister, Lyle Mohamed, said it is in that context that the current administration sees the media as partners in progress. For the media to be able to play its role, which is to inform, criticize and stimulate debate, it must take responsibility for whatever it pulls out. In other words, it must get its facts right. In an era of fake news and misinformation, the minister emphasized that the government has done a lot to ensure that the menace is contained. Fake news has ruined homes, pushed many into depression, and done untold hardship to others. It is a clear and present danger to all. I believe it should not be out of place for reputable media organizations like The Guardian to set up a special desk for fact-checking as a panacea for this problem. Assuring the minister of The Guardian newspaper's support and desire to partner with the federal government, the editor-in-chief, Martins Onoja, said his organization is doing all in its capacity to contain the situation. We remain loyal to the Federal Republic of Nigeria and the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And as you have seen over the last 38 years of The Guardian, we have remained committed to good journalism. In Abuja, Anthony Forson, NTN News. Geospatial information is a major solution in exploring the solid minerals and crime fighting. To achieve this, surveyors and mining experts are meeting in Abuja. Mir Ogidi reports. Digging deep to get a precious mineral through a crude process. So, accidental discovery is what they depend on. Making the best of the natural resources through artificial intelligence informed this general meeting of surveyors in assisting the federal government in diversifying the economy. Advancement in GIS and web mapping technologies, we can have standalone GIS to enterprise GIS and web GIS. If you talk about the economy, agriculture, road construction, environmental issues, name them. We are everywhere. Technology is expensive. But the surveyors and the government are unrelenting. Nigeria has a lot stock of qualified and experienced surveying geomatics and special information managers to help government drive its policies and programs to successful conclusions. And our government are listening to us. I tell you, what we had last year, budget-wise, is a little bit better this year than what we had last year. Such synergy is a great harvest for the federal government diversification program, especially in the solid minerals sector. Mie Ogede, NTN. Following recent attacks on police personnel and formations in the southeast and south-south region, former Inspectors General of Police are brainstorming with the Acting Inspector General of Police to find lasting solutions to the attacks and other security challenges in the nation. Chairman of the Police Service Commission, Musiliu Smith, in an interview with newsmen in Abuja, said it has become necessary for all stakeholders to work together towards securing the country. Francis Fon reports. Hardly a day passes without a report of attack on either the Nigeria Police Force or the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, by unknown gunmen in the southeast and south-south zones, destroying critical national infrastructure. Worried by this, past Inspectors General of Police and the Acting Inspector General of Police are discussing with a view to nip the problem in the board. The police stations, they are too open. They are not supposed to be open. 
they should be constructed and protected in such a way that it will, it will not be easy for any ruffians to attack. We have to ensure that every level of police station, they have the number of modern weapons and good armory to house them, so that if there is any attempt, or even for the people who will be guarding the place. Former Inspector General of Police and Chairman Police Service Commission, Muslim Smith, advocated increased funding of the police to bridge the infrastructure gap, which has exposed the force to attacks. Frank says from NTA News. In ensuring proper hygiene for pupils in schools who are beneficiaries of the National Homegrown School Feeding Program, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, Sadia Umar Farouk, has flagged off the distribution of feeding utensils to public schools in the Federal Capital Territory. Youth Ruth Aguale reports. Thank you for the food. Thank you for everything. A show of gratitude Kwali to Isabella, a pupil of LEA Primary School, Jabi, in the Federal Capital Territory. She is one of the beneficiaries of the National Homegrown School Feeding Program. With the resumption of the program across the country, after a short break as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development has flagged off the handover of feeding utensils to public schools in the territory as part of efforts to ensure good meal and good utensils. The purpose of this intervention is to ensure that target peoples have the best experience of integrity and safety during their consumption of the free meals that is being provided by the federal government. And this note I hereby, to the glory of God Almighty, flag of the distribution of this intensive nationwide starting with the federal capital charity. With that handing over, the minister took a step further to inspect the meals being given to the children. What do you say to Mama? I enjoyed the food. I ate rice and egg. One meal a day, more enrollment in schools. So far, about 10 million children across the country are benefiting from the program. This is part of the strategy by the federal government in reducing poverty and out-of-school children in the country. In Abuja, Ruth Aguele, NT News. Meanwhile, sound moral upbringing of the child secures a peaceful society. This informed the decision by the Minister of Women Affairs, Dem Pauline Tallinn, and FCT Minister of State to give the Nigerian child the best in this year's Children's Day celebrations in Abuja. Ngozi Silva Technico reports. They may not be aware of the challenges ahead of them, but shaping it appropriately is a major salvation. COVID-19 did not only lock the streets, but also the schools, and this comes with huge setback for children. Though the gates are opened, but providing favorable environment to actualize their potentials as future leaders is topmost in this year's Children's Day. Effect of COVID-19 on the total well-being of the child, the way forward is the central message this year. And the Minister of Women Affairs and her FCT counterpart call for synergy among Nigerians to end all forms of child abuse. Nigerian children can act anywhere in the world. Their resilience, their and their commitment to anything they need is always uh, my message is that uh, emphasis on children by government and government agencies should be a continuous one. May 27th is the day for the children, and that seems even too far. I can't wait for the 27th of May to celebrate our day. This program has enlightened not just the government, but we people, that the well-being of the Nigerian child is paramount. Ngozi Silva, Technico, NTA News. President Muhammad Buhari has congratulated mother of the governor of Kwara State, Alhaja Raliat Abdurazak, on the occasion of her 91st birthday. 
President Buhari joins family members, friends and well-wishers in honoring al Hajjah's devotion to serving humanity and community, blazing the trail as the first female councillor in Kwara State and working passionately to provide quality education to the less privileged. The President prays Allah to grant the nonagenarian more years of good health. The federal government is to develop all abandoned stock routes and grazing reserve with a view to addressing farmers' headers conflict and transhuman activities. Musabab Ali has the details. This houseman is moving about 100 cattle from one location to another in search of greener pasture and water for his animal, as well as running away from rustlers. Veterinary experts are of the view that the collapse of federal and state government grazing reserves is responsible for the frequent clashes between farmers and herders. You may be hearing about livestock trans transformation plan and all this and all that. I think we are consolidating all these policies into one. And we are going to focus on the development of ranching and on the development of dairy production. The plan by the federal government, therefore, is to settle cattle breeders in one place where grazing areas as well as water drinking points, schools and healthcare facilities will be provided. As at 2013, the federal government has a total of 2 million hectares of grazing reserves in 21 states. In Abuja, Musa Baba Aliyu, NTA News. All right, to give more insight on this issue is the Executive Secretary, Agriculture Research Council of Nigeria, Professor Hamidou Sharubutu, and he joins me from our Enugu studio. You're welcome to NTN Network News, Prof. Very much, and uh, good evening, Nigerians. Start uh, by getting your view on the proposal of the federal government on livestock development. Well, um, the issue of um, the development of livestock and specifically the issue of grazing reserve is an age-long uh, problem that we have in this country. And so for the federal government, this is an inherited program. And I can tell you that uh, immediately after independence, the federal government actually, with the help of the international community, and specifically ILCA, uh, stationed in Kenya, under the auspices of the African uh, Union, uh, at that time the OAU, decided to come up with a program called the Fulani Amenity Program. And that was a program that was supposed to settle the Fulani gradually and providing them with the necessary amenities. And what are these amenities? These amenities are watering pond, uh, development of fodder, that is the food they are supposed to eat in terms of grasses and legumes, then provision of livestock stores for feed, as well as clinic. Now, this program did not succeed because at inception, it took off as a very, very serious program. But just like other programs, it, it collapsed. Then the first national livestock development program came up. The second livestock development program also came up. But all these have been programs that were truncated because funding has not been there, political will has not been there. Now, during the Jonathan administration and towards the tail end, the federal government, looking at the problem that has bedeviled this country because insecurity was now being introduced into the issue of livestock development, decided to develop grazing reserve. And because the regime did not continue, the Buhari regime came up and decided to continue with the program. Remember that this was the program that was actually developed under the chairmanship of Ben Suswam, who was the chairman during Jonathan's regime. And uh, because the new uh, National Economic Council came up, they decided to read the minutes, the last minutes of the meeting. And so they decided to adopt it. Now, this led to the birth of the National Livestock Transformation Program. But along the line, nomenclature took hold of the whole program. And so people now started reading meaning into the whole thing. Today, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, and I want us to be very, very specific about the nomenclature, the name of that, that ministry. It's Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. 
And because it has to do with rural development, and livestock rearing is a rural activity, the Honorable Minister, Elijah Sabono Nono, decided to take this as a very, very serious issue to see what they can do about livestock. But let me say this. Livestock is a national asset. The Fulani or whoever is rearing cattle is only holding that asset in trust for the nation. Because if the livestock are not there, we may have to go outside this country and then import thereby creating jobs elsewhere. Now with this initiative of trying to develop this grazing reserve, I think it is something that we should all key into for those who are willing. And let me say this, that we have over 415 demarcated grazing reserves in this country, spread across the northern part and some part of the southwest, particularly in Oyo State. Now, those that were actually uh, gazetted are about 112. So this is where we are, and there is a need for us to really move into and try to see what we can do to develop them. Professor, just uh, very, very quickly now, because we are running out of time, how can states in the south also benefit from this program? Very quickly. Benefit from this program. You see, when the National Livestock Transformation Agenda actually came in, it was a concept that was supposed to be for the willing. Those that are actually willing to donate land, those governments that are ready to actually key into so that a counterpart type of arrangement will be made. And I want to make an I mean, give an example of a program that I am involved in. That is the program in Plateau State. Each state government is supposed to look at the blueprint and adopt it with peculiar uh, attention to his culture, to his religion, and to the disposition of his own people. In Plateau State, the, the governor, what he intends to do is to say, those indigenous people that have livestock will also have a share to develop their own ranches, while the grazing reserves that were already gazetted in Wase Kanam will now be used to settle the Fulani people that are there. So these are the type of arrangements that will be adopted by the various states' government. Secretary, Agriculture Research Council of Nigeria, Professor Hamidou Sharubutu, thank you for your time. All right, Nigeria's first lady, Aisha Buhari, wants parents and other well-meaning Nigerians to join hands in the war against insecurity by ensuring good upbringing of their children and wards. The plea came up at the fifth presidential diary magazine award ceremony, which provided the opportunity to honor some Nigerians who have demonstrated leadership in the quest to have a better nation. David Ayre reports that the Director General of the NTA was honored at the event. The First Lady Aisha Buhari is gladdened that the journey of the Presidential Diary magazine has led to the empowerment of many youths in the society. Represented by the Special Assistant to the President on African First Lady's Peace Mission, Dr. Myro Almakura, the First Lady is optimistic that Nigeria will soon overcome the security challenges facing it. My office has been in the forefront of the campaign against drug abuse and other forms of drug that seek to destroy the very fabric of our society. My passion and commitment towards tackling the drug abuse menace prompted the inauguration of the Presidential Advisory Committee on the Elimination of Drug Abuse. All Nigerians should remain upstanding, especially now where insecurity is a central discourse in the country and there is definite linkage between drug use and insecurity. Some of the awardees, including the Director General of the NTA, Yakubu Ibn Mohammed, Special Advisor to the President on Media and Publicity, Femi Adeshino, and the Governor of Nasarawa State, Abdullahi Suley, were represented at the event. It's important that when you recognize leadership, then you have followership. So for me, um, this is a very important uh, award. In addition to Buhari's uh, change agenda, we thought there was need for us to introduce, to be part of it. The Presidential Diary magazine is published monthly in Abuja. David Irie, NTA News. Now let's turn our attention to uh, Lagos Network Center, where Ingunu is waiting to bring us the very latest. Ingunu. 
Thank you, Joseph. Lagos State Governor Babajide Sanwolu and his Ogun State counterpart, Dapo Abiodun, have signed a historic memorandum of understanding to establish Joint Development Commission to boost trade facilitation and infrastructural development in both states. Musa Toliat reports that the MOU was signed at a colorful event in Ogun State. The Lagos Ogun Joint Development Commission has a mandate to work out modalities on areas of cooperation in agriculture, particularly in rice production, waste management, water supply, and infrastructural development in both states. Governor Babajide Sonwolu stressed that the two states are leveraging on areas of comparative advantages to meet the socioeconomic needs of their citizens and create a conducive business environment to attract investments. Regardless of the challenges, we are determined to build a more livable and stable city. Our goal is to build a sustainable urban city where both the residents of Lagos and Ogun have a sense of belonging. They embrace a participatory issues around governance and they recognize their role as achieving a solid urban economic growth for the two states. On its part, Governor Dakwabi said the establishment of the Joint Development Commission stems from their mutual commitment to revive the defunct Lagos Ogumega City project conceived in 2005 by former governors Bola Tinubu and Olusheg Moshoba administrations. The official launch of this commission today will further initiate and accelerate more projects necessary to aid ease of movement of our people goods and services, as well as increased industrialization along our border communities and ensure a wholesale development of our both states. The Memorandum of Understanding to establish a joint commission between Lagos and Ogun states has been described as a game changer capable of addressing the social economic issues that would make life meaningful for citizens in both states. There were good messages from traditional institutions public and private sector players. In Lagos, Musa Toliad, NTA News. Substandard tires worth over 6 million naira have been confiscated in Lagos. The tires stocked in a warehouse at a remote area outbound of Lagos was evacuated by a team of task force in charge of standards of products. Abola de Salami reports. Failure to meet up with standard in the importation of products is responsible for the confiscation of the more than 100 containers housing the substandard tires stocked at this warehouse. The tires stocked in between themselves failed the basic parameter test conducted on them. This prompted the tax force team to seal off the warehouse to avoid circulation of the tires. Instead of bringing the tires into individual containers, the purveyors of this nefarious activity stuff them into one another. So for example, if they are bringing 300 uh, tires in one container, they will now have the opportunity of bringing, bringing about 1,500. In doing that, it compromises the quality of the tire. You know, the tire is made up of wires and carbon, and our tests reveal that the tensile strength of, of the tires have been compromised and they are no more fit for purpose. In addressing the issue of road carnage, the agency appealed to Nigerians to desist from patronizing dealers of fake vehicle parts and other products. In Lagos, Aboladi Salami, NTA News. It's now time for a break. The news will be back shortly with Benny Adams in Abuja. <laughs> You can get more news and updates on www.nta.ng or follow us on our Twitter handle at NTA News Now. You can also like us on Facebook at www.facebook forward slash NTA Network News. And also stay connected and subscribe to our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash NTA News Online. Also remember to watch our news live streaming at www.nta.ng forward slash live. Good to have you join us on the business side of the news. I am Benny Adams. And we start by telling you that the Monetary Policy Committee, NPC, has voted to retain monetary policy rates, that's the NPR, 
and all parameters to support the fragile economic recovery and propel productivity. Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefele, at the end of the committee's meeting in Abuja, called on those posing security threat to the country to embrace the Anko Boras scheme. Let's join Lea Katun Babatunde for details. There are expectations that prices will rise globally as central banks around the world sustain monetary nominalization. In Nigeria, the fundamentals show a moderate recovery as an non oil sector drove real GDP growth in the first quarter of 2021, with agriculture contributing the largest. The Central Bank of Nigeria has continued to support the federal this government in the recovery process and has increased pandemic, the targeted credit facility by another 100 billion naira to 400 billion naira to boost liquidity. But Governor Mefele has some advice for bad debtors uh, and troublemakers. And I therefore would like to appeal to our brothers who decide that they want to live in the bushes and forests that they should please begin to retreat, drop their arms, and come and embrace Uncle Bora's program. On the dollar for Nara extension, the bank posits that it will encourage diaspora remittances, which Nigeria is already encouraging through diaspora bond investments. The 279th meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee had all members agreeing on policy direction aimed at controlling inflationary trends. On the CBN intervention facility to the state government, we are engaging National Economic Council, and CBN is also insisting on his loan to be paid. Depending on the outcome of engagement between Central Bank, Finance and National Economic Council, we will begin to take the money. He also insists the bank has no tolerance for cryptocurrencies, but is working to see digital currency come to life in Nigeria. In Abuja, Leah Katung Baba, Chunde, NTA News. And on the capital market, investors lose 16.06 billion naira as NGX All Share Index dips by 0.08% amid positive market turnover. Equities market closed at 38,256.76 basis points as against 0.10% depreciation recorded previously. Market breadth closed negative as Sai Leasing led. 12 gainers as against 17 losers, topped by Lasako at the end of today's session. Market turnover closed positive as volume moved up by 77.27% as against 19.02% recorded in the previous session. Cotville, Zenit Bank and Jais Bank were the most active to boost market turnover, while Zenit Bank and Guarantee topped the market value list. That's business news. Joseph is over to you. Thank you, Penny. The First Lady of Nigeria, Aisha Mohammed Buhari, has sympathized with the families of the officers and men of the Nigerian Air Force involved in the plane crash in Kaduna. The First Lady, in a message, assured the family that they are not alone in this monumental grief. State House correspondent Ali Kabir reports. The First Lady of Nigeria, Aisha Mohammed Buhari, has sent a delegation under the leadership of the Special Assistant to the President on African First Lady's Peace Mission, Dr. Mairo Al-Makura, to the Nigerian Air Force Base Abuja to condole with the families of the flying officers and men involved in the Thursday plane crash in Kaduna, which claimed the lives of Chief of Army Staff and other officers of the Nigerian Armed Forces. The First Lady has condoled with the wife and the family of Flight Lieutenant Late Ayodeji Alfred Olufade and Late Sergeant Okwemi Adeshino and other men and officers involved in the tragedy. While commiserating with their family members, the First Lady assured them of her support at all times. Like we all know, the nation is mourning and the First Lady is not exceptional to it. She has um, asked us to come on her behalf to mourn with the, the, the deceased family. We, we cannot question why it happened, because every soul shall test it. And it is their time. All we pray is for Almighty Allah to grant them the rest, and the family, the fortitude to bear this horrible loss. Buhari also gave them words of encouragement, adding that the whole country is with them in absorbing the shock of the sudden death of their loved ones. In Abuja, Ali Kabir. NTA News.
And the First Lady has described late Aisha Jumay al Hassan as a pillar of support to Nigerian women, irrespective of their background. He stated this in Abuja during a condolence visit to the family of the deceased, who died recently after a protracted illness. State House correspondent Ali Kabir again reports. Condoling the family of late Aisha Jumay al Hassan, who was a former Minister of Women Affairs, the First Lady of Nigeria, Aisha Muhammad Buhari, was received by the members of the family of the deceased, led by her younger brother Ibrahim Abubakar Jalengo. While consoling with the family, the First Lady described late Aisha Jumay al Hassan as the tribalized woman pillar of support to all Nigerian women and a source of inspiration, she added that Lady Jume Alassan was a courageous woman who stood in for the advancement of women, especially the welfare and the well-being of girl child. She prayed to Allah to grant her al genital free dose. Mrs. Buhari described the death of late Maman Traba as she was popularly known as the loss to not only the family but the whole nation, especially for the women and children. In the meantime, the First Lady has condoled with the wife and the family members of late Brigadier General Olatunji Olainka, who died in a recent plane crash in Kaduna alongside the late Chief of Army Staff and other gallant officers. Late Olainka, until his death, was the Provost Marshal of the Nigerian Army. The First Lady, in a condolence message through the Special Assistant African First Lady's Peace Mission, Dr. Mero Almakura, described let Olayenka as a true patriot. She has asked me to tell them this is not just their grief, it's not just the Nigerian army, but the whole country. And she's with them in prayers, and she she prays that Almighty guide them right. The children and the family has left behind. In Abuja, Ali Kabir, NTA News. President Mohamed Buhari has sent a high-powered delegation to commiserate with the government and people of Anambra State, Adamawa State, I should say, over the death of the former Minister of Agriculture and Forestry in the defunct northern Nigeria. Simon Asha reports. The delegation led by the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Mohamed Musabello, also has Minister of Agriculture, Mohamed Sabonanono, and Senior Special Assistant to the President of Media and Publicity, Garabashiu, among others. They were received on arrival at Yola International Airport by Chief of Staff, Government House Yola, Professor Maxwell Gidado. The delegation proceeded to the family compound of late Abdullah Damburanjada to extend the condolence message of President Muhammad Buhari, who described him as an icon of peace and development, whose legacy lives to stand the test of time. We are here as part of the delegation by Mr. President, President Muhammad Buhari to come and extend his condolence and the family of the late elder statesman of the dying number of them. Dahiru Muhammad, who received the delegation on behalf of the family, thanked the president for trying with them during their moment of grief. The delegation was also at the government house Yola to condole with Governor Amadou Maru Fintri and the entire state over the great loss. Uh, we want you to extend our history with gratitude to the security in Yola, Simon Asher, NTA News. The death has been announced of Mother Cecilia Equozo, a.k.a. Chinedu. She was aged 97. Burial arrangement in honor of late Mother Cecilia Equozo takes place tomorrow at Umoriam village, Norfia, Njikoka, local government area, Anambra State. This is to be followed by a mass at St. Anthony's Catholic Church, Norfia, while interment follows immediately. Late Mother Cecilia Equozo is survived by engineer Dominic Equozo and Peter Equozo director with the Federal Ministry of Science and Technology. And that's the news for tonight. Thank you very much indeed for your company. I'm Joseph Johnson. Remember to always connect with the NTA to stand against rape and rapist. Bye-bye.